Hi, I'm John Castle. I'm going to be talking about bioinformatics and the Wolfram language. Uh, we're going to be looking about how to bring in bioinformatics data, both from what Wolfram supplies internally and also from external sources. Then we'll look at all kinds of analysis, including sequence alignment, sequence motifs. We'll be finding uh, motifs in, in graphs patterns of gene regulation networks. It's going to be uh, great. And so take care. Hi, everybody. Uh, good morning. Uh, I'm John Castle. I'll be talking about bioinformatics in the Wolfram language. I uh, work with the Wolfram Alpha Scientific Content Group and excited to show you what we have. So uh, first I'll give uh, kind of an introduction, uh, then I'll show some of the computable data that's built into the Wolfram language, uh, but it's not limited to that. We'll uh, show you how to gather and import uh, external data. Uh, then we'll turn to analysis and analyzing sequences doing sequence alignment, sequence clustering, sequence motifs, uh, and then turn from sequences to analyzing and modeling interactions between different biological components, and then we'll conclude. So for uh, the purposes of this talk, bioinformatics is the process of computing inferences about the structure and functioning of biological components using obtainable data in an integrated way. So the, uh, we're going to give us just a, a small survey of how existing Wolfram language features help facilitate this kind of bioinformatics. We're, this is going to be a, uh, only cover really kind of some basic applications that illustrate work basic functionality rather than providing a comprehensive workflow. So there's a lot more that you can do. Don't be fooled by this what's here. So just as a very brief biology primer, uh, here we have uh, DNA. Uh, with its characteristic double strand form. The, the interesting thing about it being that these, these pairs here uh, can be kind of substituted anywhere up and down the line, but once one of, the pair, uh, one of these residues is bound, only the other, another kind of complementary residue can be bound. And thus this forms a kind of code that uh, allows a heritable information to be passed on. Uh, these, uh, this, this strand here, then becomes the basis for uh, containing both the information that's translated into proteins, the workhorses of the cell, as well as operational information that uh, regulates whether or not uh, the protein uh, is created uh, under different circumstances. So here we say, so if the promoter is bound, then this DNA is uh, kind of read from here uh, into two reading frames. They're, they're transcribed into RNA, uh, which uh, then are, uh, have these sequences here for binding to the ribosome, which actually do the work of taking amino acid sequences together and turning them uh, into, uh, into proteins. So they, I guess there are two kinds of sequences available to do analysis on here, uh, uh, kind of DNA sequences and the protein sequences that are generated as a result. So uh, th there's a lot of computable data for this kind of information in Wolfram Alpha. First, we can get uh, overviews with this double equals command. So here, we're going to be looking at MUS81. This is a gene that, uh, that uh, when uh, expresses a protein, can repair a particular form of damage that happens during DNA replication. So here we see that we have its name, other names, where we find it on the gene, its reference sequence nearby genes, what part of the sequences are actually used in building the protein, uh, molecular weights, and uh, the functions that the gene performs. So here we see DNA repair. It's part of DNA recombination. Uh, this is the gene ontology tax taxonomy is uh, a really well uh, built ontology for characterizing uh, cellular activity very specifically. Here we see a comparison to how this gene uh, expre expresses itself in the sequences of different organisms, what part of the sequence are actually used within the protein, and, and so forth. Now, we also are not limited to uh, sequences that are already necessarily specified, but we can take sequences in, uh, determine what amino acids they uh, they're consist of, and find where on the human reference genome they occur and uh, how that compares to the number that you would expect if they were, uh, if the, they were randomly uh, available across the genome. 
Now, once you have the gene and it's translated into the protein, we also have some information about that, including the uh, reference sequence and uh, uh, molecular weight and, and this, this kind of thing. Uh, and not only do we have information about these sequences, we also have some information about processes, such as metabolic pathways, the processes by which food and fuel are converted into the structured energy of biological systems. Here's uh, the TCA cycle, one of the most important well-conserved cycles in all of biology. Now, let's see here. Hmm. There we go. Okay. Now, uh, now, once you've got an overview of what you might like to look at, you can actually dig into that with entities. Uh, entities provide a consistent experience the, in a, by giving a uniform way to get our data. So here's uh, the MUS81 gene as an entity, and then we go through and using entity value, display all these as a data set, and we see we have the gene length and the molecular function names and all of the good stuff that's available in Wolfram Alpha is now available here in computable form. Protein, similarly, uh, you have a name protein, uh, you can look it up, get, gather information about there, including its domains and wh where it appears. Now, MUS81, I'm just using that as an illustration, not very popular protein. Aconitase, extremely popular protein, occurs in like, you know, the TCA cycle. So we have even more information about it. We have the chain labels and we have secondary structure information and diagrams about it. Let's look at those diagrams a bit more. So here it comes in. And that's okay, but let's blow this up with, uh, by importing it. And so we have this structure here, and we see that we, uh, we have a lot of these alpha helices and beta sheets, two different kinds of structure. And sure enough, we can tell you where along the, the protein sequence that structure can be found. We also provide uh, uh, SNPs. These are single nucleotide polymorphisms. These are the kind of differences between uh, the reference genome and population data. And this is really useful for things like the 23andMe analysis and this kind of thing, as these are where traits, diseases, heritage, and evolutionary history can frequently be tracked. So a third way of getting uh, the uh, even more computable data is we have provide some specific data functions for these, such as genome data, uh, so it's uh, much of the same information, but back in a, kind of a, a different form, kind of a well, maybe a lower level form. Although so, something else that's here is genome lookup. So if you have a particular sequence you, you'd like to find computably, then uh, you can find where along the chromosome these occur. And we see that that, yep, that lines up. And protein data also available in, in this form. Um, So uh, uh, we, I guess we have a lot of what the, the reference data, but if you're really go, going to experimental data or uh, other broad sources, you really want to get out there and uh, gather, like, you know, whatever experimental data is important to, like, your particular application. So the NCEBI NTRES e-utilities is a really kind of a major suite for getting uh, access to all of NCBI's National Center of Biotechnology Information's databases, They've uh, done a great job in making them uniform. And we've provided a variety of resource functions for accessing the different services that are available as, uh, from NCBI. So e-info, we kind of get the databases, and then we see, kind of see like uh, the schema for those databases. So here we see in the gene database, there's a, uh, among other things, a gene name field. So that'll be handy for us later. Now we look to our, uh, looking at EG query, that, which gives the count of records for each term in each NCBI database. So we look for our old friend MUS81, and sure enough, we find it has a good number of records inside of the gene database. Oh, uh, yeah, it, we can, uh, let's see here. Source function. So. Uh, yeah, uh, sorry, I, I guess I'm, 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 I'm showing a lot. I'm not uh, evaluating things as I'm going through just for, to expedite things, but sure enough, it all did work at one time and will, should work in the future.
Ah, so uh, now that we have uh, e search, uh, uh, so it, given that we ha have the, the, the gene database, the gene field, look for MUS81, and we do have a number of records here. Uh, for each of those records, we can use the e summary service to get a summary of, of what's in there, and then for uh, use their e fetch to really go deep into, uh, into what the structure is. Here, looking at which parts of the sequence are actually expressed in the protein. Now, uh, a little service that they provide is actually biological spelling correction. So uh, here I misspell mitochondrial, uh, but here it's fine. And there's a, a lot more information about this, including an appendix to these slides. So other data sources, uh, PDB, we saw it before, we'll see it again. It's uh, really great, well-supported uh, here. One thing that's nice is also the European Bioinformatics Institute, the European equivalent to the NCBI, uh, really has extensive sources and they provide them all in REST APIs, which is great. So you, you just URL execute, you get it as JSON, and then you put it in data sets and all across their, their platform, it's all uh, kind of really uniform and, and, and quite nice. So uh, now that you've uh, got some data, uh, it might be in a particular format that you'd prefer not to, to wrangle yourself, but have in a nice computable form. So uh, yeah, GenBank is a standard for exchanging uh, annotated DNA sequences. And here we have an example of pulling that structure out. Now, even, here's something that's nice. Using the NCBI services, we fetch one, and we find that there's, uh, you know, they didn't uh, include a standard element in there. But even then, we still can recover all of the structure that we, uh, that we need. So uh, these services are pretty robust, even to uh, if they if, uh, you get something that, where they choose to leave some data out. FASTA, also a, sta a standard for exchanging DNA and protein sequences. Uh, so th this is going to FASTA, pull out the headers, pull out the sequences, no problem. PDB, as we saw before, we can get into the structure of PDB files, get those back in a nice uh, data set. And we have a variety of other sources for, uh, these are for microarrays and pyrosequencing and things that really happen earlier in the kind of experimental process should you need that. All right, now, now that we're past all the data importing, we can get on to analysis, which is, is always my favorite part. So here just as a, a quick toy example to introduce sequence alignment. So here we see AT is the same. Then they, uh, A and GG differ between the two, and C is the same. So if you see these in the future, that's what's, go that's what's going on. Uh, now looking at EM81, e or EM1, uh, which, uh, so we, we see that in, uh, we have data for humans, mice, rats, and chimpanzees. So we're gonna go ahead and comp compare those for the this purpose of this alignment. And so we have, uh, we, we gather the EM1 gene entities for each of those. We gather the reference sequences for each of those. And now we, uh, so we have our data. Now, to, to do this alignment comparisons, we're going to be using the Smith-Waterman similarity, which is the standard local similarity score for this work. Unfortunately, that is not normalized. So depending on the, sequence, the length of the sequence, your results can, uh, can vary. So we'll normalize that. And we'll also create a distance metric. That's the uh, inverse. So the smaller, the, the closer together they are, the more similar they are. Now, if we, uh, if we uh, perform sequence alignment on mice and rats, we find that uh, it, it's, pretty, it's pretty choppy. The alignment isn't uh, necessarily that great. There are a lot of sequences that they don't share. Well, uh, humans and chimpanzees seem to share a lot, looking at the beginning of the sequence alignment. But if we look at uh, here, we see at the beginning of the sequence, they share quite a bit. Well, later on, it doesn't look like the alignment is quite so great. So uh, it, the jury's still out, so let's, let's do some clustering to see uh, how alike they actually are. And computing the similarity ratio across all of them, we find that actually it does line up quite well. Uh, we have uh, 
yeah, the cluster, the, the clusters for between human disease and, and rats and mice. Seen here, uh, you see how these are kind of taller than uh, still are the baseline. And that the, cl the cluster density is also where we would think. Now, uh, so, so sequence alignment doesn't necessarily tell us what parts of the, the uh, sequence are really the working parts of the gene, the parts that are gonna be conserved across evolution to do what the, what the gene is actually supposed to do. So now we're gonna extract some motifs or kind of common se sequences that are between them. So I'm working from this paper, we, uh, we, we're gonna be comparing uh, yeast, fruit flies, mice, and humans using the tools we gathered before uh, of eSearch and eFetch. We gather each of these sequences. Now uh, we're gonna just do a very quick and dirty thing where we're gonna find the longest common sequence shared between all of those sequences and then align each of the each of the, the sequences to that common sequence and when we do that we, and using this uh, underscore to indicate only a single character difference we find these local motif blocks that if we transpose together and find the minimum of we find this uh, this one right here which matches kind of the reference comparison we were. So even with doing something very, very simple, we were able to extract uh, the, the better part of the kind of the key motif for this protein. Uh, if you wanna do something more sophisticated, then uh, what, there are so many great algorithms out there. Uh, let's see here. Yep, so we have, uh, in this case, EB, EB, the European Bioinformatics Institute offers about you know, eight different clustering uh, techniques. We'll choose Cluster Omega, which is kind of a standard middle of the road choice. And using their web service and processing their results, we still find that we get back to where we, where we wanted the, uh, the IVERC VDL sequence. So, Bioinformatics is not only great for understanding the functionality of particular biological structures, but is also great for understanding interactions. And this is a, or kind of a really exciting topic here. Now, this is the regulatory network of, of E. coli. Uh, and where the, the, the red arrows are uh, activating and the blue arrows are inhibitory. And so this looks fairly complicated. We see a lot of negative self inhibitions, which seems curious that a gene would turn itself off. So uh, let's, let's see if that's actually, is a thing and what it's about. So let, let's compare the uh, number of times that occurs in our set, uh, in, in the data set versus uh, what we'd expect at random. So the number of self regulators that occur is 59. The number that we'd expect at random is 1.2. So that's where we have about 46 standard deviations more than we would expect by randomness alone. So, so what's happening here? So suppose we model the concentration as, uh, as, as this production rate. We're gonna assume uh, mRNA and production degradation, they happen too fast for this process, so they're in quasi steady state. Degradation is too slow, so it's negligible. And we end up with, with this curve here. And now if we add an autoregulation term with, uh, with the sigma, what we see is that we get a good burst straight away that, that tapers off with a, with a uh, transcription factor binding of about a third. And so what this means is, is that uh, you can, for these genes, it's important for them to be activated right away. As soon as they get the, the signal, they're off and running and producing a lot of, 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 of proteins but then, then tapering off uh, sooner so that you know, they're, they're not overproduced. So you can tell that the, it, if, if something's negatively, uh, like negatively auto-regulating, it's important that it gets activated kind of like you know, right away that it, it really responds to its environment. Now, that, that was uh, kind of interesting, uh, but let, let's see if we can discover something that we couldn't necessarily see 
in amongst ourselves. So we're going to look at all the three node interactions. So here we isolate all the subgraphs of the three interconnected nodes here. And then uh, we gather them into isomorphic groups. So this is, this is kind of neat. Just by saying uh, for, for each edge pair group, for its graph, find the first isomorphic group that's, that's, uh, that's like it. If we don't find one, it's a, it's a new group, otherwise dependent to its existing group. And we find that here that the only uh, three node isomorphic set that isn't just two edges is this, this pattern here, this feed forward pattern where there's an edge connecting to the end and there's one happening in the middle. So uh, are these significant? And it, so there are 126 of them and we expect at random about 1.9. Yeah, so yes, that's, there's like, uh, you know, 64 times like standard deviations more than we would have otherwise. So what's going on with the dynamics here? So we'll go ahead and find the most common dynamics by removing the labels from the graph and then, and then tallying them. And we find that this all activation uh, path is the most, the most common. And so this is, co uh, this is kind of coherent dynamics. Uh, there's nothing's in, uh, inhibiting it, all activating. And what happens here is that if both, uh, if Z depends on both, oh, let's see here, I'll show this graph over here. If Z depends on both X and Y, then if Z starts here, and then y starts a bit, a, a bit less, depends on z, then z is very slow to respond to initial concentrations of x. And what, what, this, what this means biologically is that uh, we really want to be careful that z has to respond to x, but x can get turned on and off for a little bit. It can be noisy, and it's really important that we don't have that much, that much z until, you know, it's really, we're really sure that, uh, that, you know, X is on and it's gonna stay on. So what we didn't cover, we didn't talk about system modeler, we didn't talk about biochemistry data, didn't talk about hidden Markov models, any number of other topics that we might have in the Wolfram language. So as a result, we see that the Wolfram language support for bioinformatics is very broad, you know, data gathering, analysis, modeling, visualization. But it's not comprehensive. I mean, there's so many more data formats, so many more sources, so many analysis things that we can add. So really, what we're open to new directions. You know, we're always interested in feedback for which you know, which we can we want to pursue what our collaborators can pursue, and so really be interested in hearing about that.